Welcome to The Happy Doc, the voice of fulfilled physicians. This show is about bringing inspirational, creative, successful, and happy health professionals to you. Get ready to learn how you can be a happy doctor too. What's up, everyone? And this is Taylor or Dr. Taylor Brana from The Happy Doc. I'm absolutely excited for you guys to be listening to this episode with Dr. David Hinden. Just to give you a little bit of a taste before I give some announcements, he's a fourth year surgery resident, he's a TED Talk speaker, and he has a YouTube series called Why Your Doctor Should Daydream. He's also an entrepreneur and innovator. Um, He has an application called Invented, which is an application that shares creative doctors and tech entrepreneurs making a difference in medicine. In this episode, we're going to be learning a tremendous amount. We're going to touch on all these topics, such as him being a TED Talk speaker, his YouTube series, what he's learned along the way, how to do a Kickstarter campaign. Um, I just learned so much from this episode with Dr. David Hinden. And he's an amazing guy, so you guys are going to learn a lot as well. I want to make some announcements before we begin. First and foremost, all of our episodes are now officially on YouTube and Spotify. So if you go on YouTube, our channel is called Happy Doc TV, and we're looking forward to developing it, creating a lot of awesome content there. And if you subscribe, you're going to get some unique content that you would not get if you listened just to the podcast. So you should check that out. If you want to look us up on Spotify, you can search The Happy Doc and all of our podcast episodes are on there. So if you're a Spotify fan, you can listen to that. We have renovated our website, which is really exciting. So check out thehappydoc.com and we've cleaned up our page and we hope you like it. And we're going to continue to innovate, renovate, and make our page look a lot cleaner as we move forward. We also have, (laughs) I have to mention this, we have the Happy Doc Lounge, which is a Facebook group. And this is tailored towards people who are creators, who are fans of the Happy Doc. And if you want to be a part of our community, this is the way to really connect. This is an intimate space. It's a place where we can share content, we can share tips. Uh, We do Facebook Live videos on there so you can get a taste of who we are and what we're up to. And you guys can um, also connect with us and we can make uh, medical culture better within our group. So this is a space for people to connect, collaborate, create, and change medical culture from the bottom up. And you should definitely be a part of that. So go on Facebook and search The Happy Doc Lounge. And you can come check us out and join us. So before we begin this episode, my ask for you this week is to tag us and a friend. So if you enjoy this content, I mean, we come back week after week and we bring you inspirational guests, interesting guests, and we want to change medical culture and we need you to help us. So tag us and a friend from medical school, from work, or a person you feel would be interested and uh, share us on on Facebook, on Twitter, on Instagram, share us in a group page that you enjoy and you think would love us. We want to share our awesome examples with the world and we can only do that with your help. So join us on our mission to change medical culture. Let's make medicine happier. Let's make medicine more fulfilled. And we can only do that with your help. Join us on our movement. With that being said, again, thank you so much for listening. You're going to enjoy this episode with Dr. David Hinden, and you're going to get a lot out of it. I know I did for sure. You can find David Hinden at www.youtube.com slash David Hinden. That's David Hinden at the end of youtube.com, D-A-V-I-D-H-I-N-D-I-N. Without further ado, let's listen to this awesome guest. Hello, everybody. This is Dr. Taylor Brana, and this is another episode of The Happy Doc. I'm super excited and pumped to have our next guest, Dr. David Hinden. He is a general surgery resident in his fourth year. He also has an amazing YouTube series, and he will discuss that. It's called Why Doctors Should Daydream. And we're going to talk about that. We're also going to discuss a lot more in the realms of creativity. 
I'm really excited for this. So Dr. David Hinden, can you introduce yourself? Sure. Uh, my name is David Hinden, and uh, thank you so much for having me. Awesome. Awesome. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a fourth year surgery resident, like you're saying, at Temple. Um, and I run a YouTube channel with this, with the same name. And, uh, I have a, I have a digital magazine called invented magazine that kind of, I'm sure we'll talk about this, but highlights up and coming innovation in medicine and kind of creative entrepreneurship and the medical tech world. Beautiful. And, you know, I'm really excited to have this conversation to start us off because I don't think there's enough talk about creativity, innovation, entrepreneurship, building in medicine. Would you agree? I totally agree. And and we're going to touch on that for sure. So to begin, um, you went into surgery for a reason, but let's start a little bit further back. Why'd you go into medical school? I went to medical school because it it felt like a a broad enough umbrella that I would find a combination of the things that I love. Um, so I've always been really interested in science and the life sciences and medicine and sort of how things work and helping people and all of those things. Um, and I've also been interested in creative pursuits and, and I, I kind of just had a feeling that medicine was such a broad field that, uh, even though I didn't know exactly what I wanted to do, I, I was hoping that I would find it. Awesome. Yeah. And I, I remember, um, before going into medicine, I had people tell me that, there's just so many fields out there. You're going to find something that clicks. Um, and, and I find that to be true. I mean, there, you know, if you're more on the, you want a touchy feely side, maybe you go into psychiatry, you love kids, you go into pediatrics. Um, if you're better with your hands, you go into something like surgery. Um, so what was it for you and, and surgery, for example? I think, I think it's a lot of, you know, it's funny that you mentioned pediatrics because I, I, I think a lot of a lot of us, when you start in the field of medicine, you either have something you've always wanted to be, or you think back to doctors that were influential in your life. Mm-hmm. Um, and I had a my dad was an anesthesiologist and and recently retired, and mm-hmm. and then I had a great a great pediatrician. And I think um, as a kid, it's a lot easier to imagine the concept of a pediatrician when you grow up. So um, I always kind of thought I might want to be a pediatrician, and I got to med school planning to do pediatrics. Mm-hmm. Um, but the creative, like the creative parts of me, um, always involved using my hands and building stuff and, and working with stuff. And when I started on my rotations in med school, I, I loved surgery. Mm -hmm. Um, I just, I loved working with my hands. Um, I had some great experiences in rotations where I got to sew a little bit and, uh, I, I realized that was going to be what I wanted to spend my life in medicine doing. Wow. That's amazing. That's amazing. So it's, it's funny. I mean, when I went on surgery, I was like, nope, I'm done. This is not for <laughs> me. Um, but no, that's amazing. Actually, I love surgery, but the actually fun question here, but how do you, how do you deal with just standing all day? Uh, uh, you get really good shoes and then you just, <laughs> uh, you get used to it and, and you try to ignore it and you sit when you can. Yeah. Oh my gosh. I remember my feet were killing me. I was, um, I was observing a couple of like, I observed like a Whipple procedure, for example. And, you know, you know, that procedure, it takes like eight hours or like nine hours sometimes. And I remember at the end, one of the residents like, I haven't peed, I haven't pooped and I haven't eaten all day. (laughs) It's like hilarious. It was, but he, at the end of it, he was like, that was awesome. You know, he was excited. Yeah. Um, Yeah. And I, I I guess that's the attitude you have to have, right? Like no matter what, even though it's a long surgery, for example, you feel like excited when you finish you know, successful procedure. I think so. I think there's a, there's a broad spectrum of personalities, even in surgery. And I am not quite that intense. Like <laughs> I will, you know, I'll, I'll feel accomplished and I'll, I'll feel, you know, it, it, it's a satisfying feeling to know that you've, you've done something for someone. Mm-hmm. Um, but I, I, I'm not one of the, the residents <laughs> who feels exhilarated at the end of those eight hours. I'm, you know, I'm glad it wasn't nine hours usually. <laughs> <laughs> sure, sure. So so let's talk about actually like uh, working with your hands for a little bit. So my understanding is you actually played the violin when you were younger, correct? That's right. That's right. I still do uh, not as much. It's it's harder to, to uh, stay involved. But yeah, I played my viol- I played violin my whole life. Um, I started when I was like in kindergarten. It just was something that, that I, I kept up with. Mm-hmm. Now, do you, do you think that, I don't know, I don't know if this is true or not. Do you think that influenced you going into something like surgery? I'm not sure. I think, I think it, 
I think it influenced me working with my hands. Yeah. Um, and uh, I think if I really like dig deep and sort of think into, you know, what, what makes up the fiber of who I am, I think mm-hmm. playing violin probably led me to sort of um, feel self-sufficient in a lot of ways mm. because um, playing violin gave me a lot of confidence to pick up other instruments. And um, I think when you get confident teaching yourself new skills that, you know, gives you confidence in other areas. Mm -hmm. So I think maybe, maybe from a kind of roundabout path, it did. Sure. Sure. Yeah. Just not a, not necessarily directly. That's amazing. Okay. So I want us to, to move forward here and I want us to touch upon first off, what, what got you excited in terms of, you know, developing more than just your clinical skills, but looking in a, in a bigger picture, was there something that influenced you down that route? Well, I think it was something that, um, and I suspect you, you can relate and and probably a lot of your listeners can relate. I think, um, I kind of had this itch for a while. Um, I, I felt frustrated by medicine uh, in terms of, um, a lot of the ways that it's lacking creativity in the traditional in the traditional practice of medicine. Um, and so I was kind of looking for a way to, to, they'll be creative in a way that was relevant for medicine. And, um, during residency, I was one of the residents that did a two year block of research time, um, which happens in surgery. You either do a five year straight through program or you do a seven, which is five plus two, which Mm -hmm. is what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. Um, and during, during my research years, I had a little bit more time and space and, um, I kind of, uh, stumbled across these, uh, apps that were magazines that lived on your phone. Um, And I was looking for something with medicine and tech and I couldn't quite find it. And, um, I decided to, to build that myself. Mm -hmm. And that was as soon as I, as soon as I made the decision, it was like this incredible creative outlet. Cause then I started learning all about how to do this and I kind of went down that whole rabbit hole. Yeah, that's, that's amazing. And I I definitely a hundred percent agree with you down the podcast route, for example, um, so I actually downloaded the app and I just took a look a little bit. So can you give like a newbie strategy? How does this, how do you get on invented and how do you utilize it? Oh, sure. Yeah. So, um, right now it's for Apple. Uh, we're going to be rolling out down the line to the Google play system, but, but the way you get it is you go to the, um, you go to the app store, you type in invented or invented magazine. Um, but if you just type the word invented, it's, it's usually the top hit. Um, and once, once you download it and you sign up and you, and you go to open up an issue, you tap the issue you want to open, it takes three or four seconds of downloads. And then it just opens up as, um, almost like a rich PDF magazine. Mm-hmm. Um, so you, you slide the pages left to right. Um, we're starting to put a little bit more video into it. Um, and, uh, what you saw was the first season of the magazine and we're, we're going to be starting to push out the second season, starting with an issue that's totally about apps and medicine. Awesome. I, I love that. So can you tell me a little bit about what like I might find starting to read the magazines on your application? Sure. So the, the focus of the, the topics that we cover, we try to highlight um, groups that are sort of um, coming up, up and coming, still in the trenches, haven't, haven't ma- necessarily made it sort of like to around the kitchen table status. Mm -hmm. Um, but groups that are doing really exciting things within the entrepreneur tech innovation space in medicine. Mm -hmm. Um, so it doesn't have to necessarily be medical devices, but something that, uh, makes people's lives better or healthier. Um, so for instance, we had a wearables issue. Mm -hmm. Um, and one of the devices was a watch that, um, kids can wear and, or adults can wear. And if they're about to have a seizure, um, it warns them. So if you're driving a car, Mm. it sort of, it it starts vibrating with enough time that you can pull over. And it's sort of designed to help people be able to lead safer lives and more independent lives because they'll, they'll have an early warning. Wow. So it'll actually read the patterns like neurologic patterns, for example, or how does that I believe that particular device functions from heart rate variability. Huh, so, that's so interesting. Um, if you look at the, uh, it's a long way away, but when, when I think back to physics, you have like, um, your, your velocity and then you have like acceleration is like the change in velocity. Mm-hmm. And then I think like jerk was the change in acceleration. Mm. So it, it's kind of like it, if, if you have a beat to beat variability, 
um, it, it's able to look at differences in the rates of your heart rate changing from one rate to another. Wow. Um, that's at least that's a, that's my simplified understanding of sure. how they're developing that tech. No, that's, that's phenomenal. And, and so it, it's interesting, you know, thinking about, you know, on your end, you're focusing on all these like up and coming innovation devices, but then, uh, and we kind of discussed ab- about this before, but you know, we talk about medicine and medical school and everything, the whole process, and it can be very stifling to creativity, stifling to innovation. What are your thoughts on these new devices coming in and and how is it actually going to be implemented, you know, on a grander scale? I don't know. I'm just spit, spitballing here, but I think it's an interesting concept. When you when you are uh, thinking of new devices, do you mean like what I mentioned, or in, in like medical surgical world stuff in general? Well, okay, I guess I guess we do have to. So yeah, with the wearables, for example, that's you know that's you know normal civilians, non medical people. But then um, yeah, so let's touch on that first. I guess wearables would be pretty easy to start to implement. Um, I I yeah. think so. I think it's it's uh, it, it's like it's this incredible, exciting time because we have this accessible technology is so much more accessible to the lay person now than it was a couple of years ago, definitely more than it was a decade ago. So people are kind of being playful, uh, like inventors and creators are sort of developing things and seeing what happens and getting into the hands of users. Mm-hmm. Um, so like, I think I keep thinking of in the back of my head, the Apple watch and like the health kit. And there is so much potential that they are sort of working in the background. Um, and are just, we're just starting to see the tip of the iceberg. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. So, um, you know, talking about wearables, for example, there's so much data now, right? Like we can yes. track so much data. Can you comment? Like, I, I'm sure you, you're aware, but can you comment, comment on some of the exciting things that are coming in terms of what we can do with that data? Yeah. Well, I mean, I, I, one of the, one of the buzzword, like the really hot, hot, uh, topics in, in the data world is like the big data world. Mm. Um, so looking at trends, um, across the board and sort of understanding, um, things that we never used to have access to before. So, um, one example, this is like more of a corporate, like Mm -hmm. big picture example in medicine. But if you look at all the, um, EMRs, which stands for electronic medical record, um, it used to be that, um, every, every data point was recorded by hand, went into a paper chart, you know, on the back end, if you wanted to do research, you'd have to pull it, pull it later. Um, but now you have patients who, let's say they're on a monitor that's um, wireless, that data is being captured and streamed into a chart. And suddenly with, with a couple clicks, when you set up everything, you know, to, to, to pull data later, you can make a couple clicks and literally see every single heartbeat someone's had in the hospital, for instance, over the past month and exactly when they got, you know, different interventions and mm. having, having access to data that that's that deep is it's kind of cumbersome, like it's hard to deal with. But um, once you are able to wrap your hands around that effectively, um, it's it's unlocking all kinds of uh, information that I believe are going to really help us uh, develop new tech and make impacts. Yeah, I'm, I'm even thinking just like on the, the personalized level, like like you talked about intervention on that individual and how that sure. impacted their heart rate. Now, you know what interventions might do one thing versus another and, you know, you know, one medication does not act the same on one person as it does on another person. Um, so that's, you know, that's a really powerful, really powerful tool. I would, I would love for us to touch on your Ted talk. Um, I took a listen to it. It was fantastic. I loved it. Thank you. Yeah. Let's, let's talk about creativity. I think it's, um, such an important concept. So, for for all of the burnt out students and residents and doctors who might who might be even listening to this, they're like, okay, creativity, whatever. I have I don't even have time to breathe right now. Um, you know, I know I know I'm sure you felt that way too. So so let's let's talk about it. how do we how do we get into the more creative mindset and how can that impact us on a on a daily on a daily basis as a doctor? I think that one way to do it is to frankly, one way to do it is to recognize that it matters and that it's important and to feel that you're, you're not doing something that's totally invalid. Um, 
little little life hacks or you know small ways that you can do it or when you have downtime um, in the shower or driving um, sometimes just letting your mind wander um, and it, it depends it's different for everyone it depends what someone's excited about um, but for me uh, one way that that you know I get to be creative is um, you know I'll think of ideas for videos or something or I have um, I, I love Evernote, the, the app. Sure. Um, and so I have a, I have a, a sheet open different categories, but for every time I have an idea for something, I just jot it down there. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think the, the best way for someone to keep that spark alive is to allow themselves to nurture being creative and to make time for it and treat it like, like a skill or like a muscle and, mm-hmm. and set aside, set aside space in their, in their world to sort of, connect with things that they enjoy, whether it's, you know, artistic stuff or any kind of self-expression. Sure. Sure. And, and, and so you touched on it, you know, for someone to be, to want to be creative, they, they have to see a purpose in it. And, you know, you touched on that in, in the, in your Ted talk uh, speech, for example, um, in, in the form of the creation of like the modern EKG, right? So yes. Yeah. Yeah. So, so why, why, why is creativity so important in medicine? I know, I know you could talk about this for a while, but like, just like a brief. Yeah. Well, you know, I think so creativity to me in medicine is absolutely, it's not like, it's not like a, an extra, extra push that it's absolutely essential because the way we practice medicine now and as we get more focused on outcomes and data and like exactly what works and what doesn't is more and more and more regimented, which makes sense. You don't want someone trying out something for the first time in the operating room or, or trying out something just because they have a hunch, you know, when you're treating a disease process that we have data and we know what works best. But if you don't keep that spark for creativity alive, it's going to stagnate the the ability to, to make progress in medicine and develop new technology and innovations. And so the reason that you, that you keep creativity alive and, and the benefit is that it lets you make new connections and realize, you know, new ways of doing things and lets you communicate with other, with other branches of medicine by collaborating. Mm-hmm. Yeah, for sure. And I think the difficulty there, and, and we actually touched on this um, in other episodes of our podcast but doctors generally have like just stayed in these silos, you know, there, yes. uh, for example, you know, the, or, or even like bad mouthing different, different, uh, specialties, for example, uh, you know, this stereotypical ortho surgeon is the one who's bench pressing and they're, they're the jocks. I mean, I guess sur- surgeons in general are, are the jocks, right. Um, mm-hmm. and they're mean and they're aggressive and this and that. And then actually, I think that takes away from the from being able just to connect with people and talk about a case, for example. Yeah, I, I agree with you. You know, I think it's funny. I think some of those stereotypes are true. Um, sometimes, you know, certainly um, by and large folks who go into surgery and, you know, interventional specialties are probably going to have a different personality type than folks who go into areas of medicine where they never see a patient face to face, for instance, or where, right. where they never leave a laboratory. Um, but one of the things that, that has been a pleasant surprise um for me with this, with this YouTube series is that people are just come out of the woodwork and say, you know, thank you for doing this. Like I felt like I was, I hear all the time. I thought I was the only one, like I I never talked to him. And I think that there are so many folks out there in medicine who feel kind of like they're starving for, for the ability to use these, these other parts of themselves that, that make them who they are. Mm Mm-hmm. I'm not sure if that answers uh, what you were asking or not. I, you know, it's it's funny. I can't 100 percent remember what I was asking, <laughs> oh, good. but I, but I love that answer. No, it was great. So you you made me think of something. So you mentioned your YouTube series, um, and I, I want us to to touch on that. Um, I I watched the some of the episodes, by the way. Um, oh, thanks. It was it was funny. You uh, you mentioned in your vlog you made a complete mistake and messed up recording with the uh, the camera. Um, That's right. <laughs> it was funny. Um, so, so let's talk about bio design. I actually really love that topic. You went over to Stanford, um, and you guys talked about bio design. I had no idea what that what that was until I saw that episode. Um, and the one thing I'm going to mention too is what I love about 
what you're doing is you're introducing concepts of creativity that people probably have never heard before, such as myself. I didn't know what bio design was. I'm still trying to understand it a little bit. Can you talk about, for example, what that was in that episode? Sure, sure. And, I, and I'll say before this, um, it's, it's kind of satisfying a selfish need too, because these are all things that I kind of want to learn more about. And it's a great excuse for me to yeah, yeah. talk to people that I'd want to talk to. And so uh, to answer your question about biodesign, um, the, the way that I think of it, at, at least w- what I learned while I was there and what I've learned so far is um, it's a process that uh, was developed to um, and really highlighted out at Stanford to have a system for innovation and for creating innovation um, over there. It's, it's specific in the medical world, but it could be applied elsewhere. Um, and mm-hmm. it's kind of borrowed from the process of design thinking. Um, and so to break down what that is and what it looks like is, um, it's a, it's a way of, um, I think of it uh, from the beginning as, as, as a way of being open-minded. So for instance, um, you don't say here's an invention. It's a great idea that I have, you know, I'm sure it's going to work. Instead, the way that the biodesign process works is you start at the beginning by looking at, um, for instance, for lack of a better expression, like an area in medicine that you want to serve. Okay. Um, or, and, and what you do is you go and you sort of, uh, put yourself at ground level, sort of observing what's happening around you. Um, and, uh, they call it needs finding. You look to see where there are, um, gaps, for instance, in, um, you know, problems that, that patients keep experiencing or, Mm -hmm. Um, struggles that clinicians have or what, what entrepreneurs sometimes call pain points. Mm -hmm. Um, and you develop, um, a list, uh, a very, very long list of all these different, of all these different needs. Um, and, and, and this is the beginning of their process. And then as the process moves on, they, they stratify the most important needs, the most pressing needs, um, you look at things like, you know, what, what might have the biggest impact if this is something that affects thousands and thousands of patients, Mm. um, versus this is something that only comes up once every couple of years. Um, you might be inclined to target, target the, uh, the need that, that it has a bigger impact in the beginning. Um, and then as they move down the line, they start, um, putting together possible solutions, um, possible ideas and ways to approach this, um, and they're, they're constantly thinning down the process until they get to sort of the end of the funnel where they've refined and refined and refined. And they have this, um, this device or product or a prototype, mm-hmm. something that has been designed from the beginning to target a really important need. It's been designed with empathy, um, looking at, at, at what the, what the user really needs or what the customer needs or, or the patient or, whoever, whoever your, your end user is going to be. Um, and it's, it's, it's incredible. It's this amazing process. And when you go through this and you're sort of like a slave to the process and and you just follow through the system, um, and you are on teams where people listen to each other and collaborate, um, they really develop just incredible things. I, I, I love that concept and I'm trying to summarize it in my mind, but basically it's, you're, you're, it's almost like this big brainstorm list, all the problems or all the pain points of the patients. And then from there, so, and that takes a long time, right? So you, it's a lot of thinking going into that. And then from there, you find the common points that can affect, impact lots of people. Um, and then you focus on how you're going to actually fix that problem with, like you said, like a design or an invention, correct? Mm-hmm. That's my understanding. I mean, that's with the caveat that, that I'm an observer and yeah. I, I've, uh, learned about what they're doing just a very little bit, but that, that was kind of, uh, one of the big, the big concepts that I took away from, from, uh, their process. Great. No. And I, and I love that. And I, and I think, I think concepts, concepts like that, you know, we're not, this is another whole point in, in, in why we're even recording this conversation, discussing this is we're, we're missing these lessons, right? There's no, there's no talk about design, creativity, innovation, in medical school. Um, and, and it's, it's so powerful to have someone like you and your YouTube series, for example, to, to show us, to go out and explore those concepts. You're going to be inspiring lots of people who, who end up tuning in and who have that creative energy in them in the space of medicine. That's, that's incredible. 
I, I would love to do that. Yeah, you know, I mean, I mean, you're doing. I mean, I'm I'm inspired oh, by you. it personally. <laughs> um, no, that's great. Um, so, so how many episodes have you recorded um, until this point? I know, I know, I saw like two online so far. Um, there, there are two online. I'm I'm in the process of uh, gearing up for a third one right now. Awesome. Um, so, so what are some of the new innovations or projects you're looking forward to exploring more of? Well, on, on, on the, the series. Yeah. Yeah. On the series, for example. Well, one of the next areas that, that I'm going to start digging into a little bit is, um, the softer skills for, so to speak, or, okay. or the humanities in medicine, because, um, there are so many benefits to learning how to appreciate art and learning how to be creative and learning how to sort of listen to your own inner voice. And, um, some of the ways that we're seeing this are, um, classes in different med schools where students actually look at a painting and they, mm. they, um, sort of work through the process of understanding, understanding things that are going on. Um, and that, that can do things like sharpening your observation skills, I think making you uh, more, more empathetic. And then there are other areas like, um, what we talk about, uh, as narrative medicine, um, where you learn how to tell a story and, and you learn how to, um, look at your own story and look at your patient's story and understand things that way. And, you know, on the surface, I think, um, people who are skeptical might say, well, that's kind of, that's just fluff that, that but, but the truth is it, it makes you a better doctor. Um, and to go kind of way out there and, and kind of like a little bit off the deep end. Um, I, I, I saw a, um, a quick soundbite from the, the founder of Alibaba recently. And he was talking about, um, I mean, this guy's brilliant. He's achieved this, you know, incredible things in his life. And he said that, you know, if you look at education around the world, it's, it's all wrong. Um, and huh. his point was that we're training people to do things that, um, computers can either do better now or we'll be able to do better. So things like, knowledge and memorizing information. I mean, you can find almost anything you want on your, on your cell phone now. Yeah. Um, and the, the gist of, of what he thinks we should be teaching people are the soft skills of being a human, of being empathetic, of being able to connect with someone and, uh, be creative and the things that are harder to generate through artificial intelligence. Um, so I think that's one of these, these, these ways that innovation that's like a more humanities driven innovation has real value. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. And I know, um, you know, talking about AI, there's a lot of fear around that right now too, about what's going to happen with AI. That's a whole, that's a whole like th three, four five day long conversation. But, um, I, I wanted to touch on something you said, um, talking about like, uh, getting more in touch with your story and the patient's story. I actually, I really love that point. Um, and I think this is something that we don't talk a lot, a lot about, but, um, there's, there's a lot of books about this too, but essentially it's the concept that in order for someone and doctors do this all the time, we think logically, we think about the data, we think about, you know, what we need to do, but if you don't touch, um, on the person's emotional parts of themselves, if you don't connect to them in the emotional space first, they're not going to trust your logic, you know? Yeah. They're not going to they're not going to believe uh, the the medication you're going to give her or believe that they're going to need that procedure. You know, I'm sure I'm sure you had experiences, maybe uh, uh, either yourself, maybe you had a bad day and you're just being really quick in the, your discussion and uh, you didn't convince the patient very well enough or you knew they this was the right decision. But you were like, look, you need to get this done. Here's the paperwork. Write the consent, blah, blah, blah. I don't know. I've seen it done. Um, and then the patient looks upset and confused and like, what the heck is going on here? Um, can you, is there an, obviously I'm not trying to throw people under the bus here, but can you think of an example or even in a positive way, how that impacts someone? Well, it's funny when, when you were saying that, I was thinking that I think every, every resident, um, sort of comes up through the system as you, you watch people that are senior to you, uh, speaking to patients in a way that you, you feel like, uh, isn't working and you feel yeah. like, you know, especially, I think when you're more junior, you're still more in touch with the idealist, idealistic parts of yourself. Right. And frankly, uh, I think younger folks in medicine are more in tune with empathy and with, and so I think, um, everyone kind of coming up through the system 
watches, you know, older attendings or sometimes their chief residents talking to patients in a way that you, you, you think they're not connecting or they don't see that they're being kind of rude and offending a patient or they don't see that they're just using language and speaking in a way that, that there's no way the average layperson would understand. Mm-hmm. Maybe it's because you know that you wouldn't have understood it a year and a half ago. Right. Um, so I, I definitely, I, I definitely have seen what you're describing. Um, I'm sure there have been times on, on rough days where I've been a perpetrator and, <laughs> and not been the best communicator. Um, yeah. but I think in, in residency, the overwhelming experience that, that I've had with that has been, um, going back to the patient's room after and sitting down with them and spending some time talking about what I suspect they probably didn't get a great explanation from, from, you know, the more senior person the first time around. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. And and it, it's interesting from my point of view, because I actually can think of several examples of this. But, you know, as a student, I think you don't perceive the amount of work, for example, that the residents are doing or the amount of work that the attendings are doing. And so, you know, as a student, you know, you're seeing like one, three patients, five patients. It depends on the, the specialty, for example. So they have more time. They can focus on the emotional stuff. But then meanwhile, the residents like, oh, crap, I need to put in these orders. I need to go see this patient. I'm sure the attending is thinking even bigger picture, like I need to follow up with these residents. And so a lot of times now I actually have more respect um, in going through the process because I understand the the many balances and the stressors throughout the whole process of you know, trying to balance that patient care, but also trying to balance the administrative tasks. And it's it's a lot. I get it. And uh, yeah, it, it's just interesting seeing, you know, where do you draw the line on on how do you deal with that? You know? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's, it's interesting. So so Dr. David Hinden, I, I appreciate your time today. Um, one thing I'm really looking forward to understanding is you're developing, you know, this process of looking at, you know, the YouTube series. I know you developed your app Invented. Um, are you looking to create anything else in the near future? Right now, my biggest focus is the the YouTube series and keeping the app alive. Um, down the line, um, I'm not sure where things are going to go. Um, I'm definitely going to keep both of those two um, pursuits going. Um, but I, I'm going to see where everything else takes me. I know that as I finish residency, I would love to find a career in academic medicine where I'm staying active as a surgeon, but, um, formally involved with innovation within wherever hospital I work. Mm. Um, so I'm, I'm trying to figure out a way to kind of reconcile all of those things together. Yeah. Yeah. That's amazing. Yeah. I'm, I'm excited for that. I'm I'm definitely going to follow the series by the way. Ooh, one thing I I was really excited about learning from you. Um, so when you made the invented app, it wasn't from your own finances. You did a Kickstarter, right? I did. Yes. And so I, I would love for you to touch on that, especially for the listeners here who have an idea. They're a little bit nervous about doing it. They're like, well, I have a big idea. I want to develop it. I think it could be good. Can you go like a little bit through that process of idea to financing, especially if, like I'm interested again, like this is my own selfish reason too. <laughs> like I'm interested. What what does it take to kind of do this whole idea to Kickstarter process and building that? Well, I think anyone can. So you can take any idea that you have to Kickstarter. Kickstarter, you know, in, in some shape or shape or form. Um, I think the. Uh, I think what made it really work for me is that um, I sort of reached out to people in advance to sort of see, I sort of talked to friends and family to see, um, not if people were telling me, Oh, I'm interested in this because everyone who loves you is going to tell you that, you know, it's a great idea, but to sort of, uh, see what, what similar things people had in their own lives, you know, did they use their phones for this type of content and then getting to, you know, the, the heart of, crowdfunding and how that affects building an idea. It's this like incredible launch pad that just sort of propels you forward because it's one thing to have an idea and say, you know, I'm going to do this sometime or you always saying, Oh, I'm working on the idea. And you know, a year later you're still working on the idea. But when you decide that you are going to put, put together this crowdfunding campaign, you have a deadline, you have uh, Mm. your name out there publicly. So you have to deliver 
And you have this like incredible, exciting momentum of being part of this uh, community on Kickstarter while, while you're doing that. Mm. Um, and it's just, it's just a wonderful thing to do. I, I think everyone that has an idea for something that they've been keeping tucked inside there should, should really consider it. Um, it's running a crowdfunding campaign is exhausting. It's like a full-time job on top of whatever you're doing. Mm. Um, but it sort of, it takes your life to, and you know, when your projects kind of to this new level that, you know, when you get there, you, you look back and, and it's taking you on this incredible journey. Hmm. So not sure if that really answered what, no, what that you were did. wondering about. That did. And I'm, I'm, I'm going to ask a couple of follow-ups there. Oh, please. Um, yeah. So what do you think allowed you, how much money did you raise through that Kickstarter, by the way? Um, nothing crazy. It was around, it was around $7,000, I think between seven and $8,000. I mean, seven, and eight, I mean, still that's, that's a lot more than zero. Um, so what do you think it takes? Like even, even at that scale, like what do you think let you be successful in that process? Best practices are, uh, a good video. I think, I think more than anything, having a good video, um, having, uh, good, good images, um, a clear, a clear voice that sort of is consistent throughout the text. Um, and then there's, there's a bunch of other strategy stuff. Um, oh, and one other thing I always tell people, um, don't look at it and don't talk about it in terms of donation. You're not telling someone donate to this project or you shouldn't tell. It's more a part of asking people to join you on this movement that, you know, whatever, whatever someone is doing on Kickstarter, when you look at the most successful campaigns, even if it's for a mug or like a, pro- it, a product, or, it's still like, join us as we create this thing and join it. It's always about this movement. Um, but in terms of like, uh, ways to ensure your success and put yourself in the best standing, having a video that really catches people, um, having good audio on that video. Um, so even if it just means, you know, giving someone a lavalier mic rather than recording on a, a crappy mm-hmm. microphone. Sure. That makes, that makes a big difference. Um, and then when you launch, um, making sure that you launch with, uh, enough people that are going to back that campaign, um, within the first cu- couple hours that, um, it won't look like a, a desert wasteland when strangers start coming to it. Oh my gosh. We could, we could talk about that for again, a while. I, I think it's so interesting in terms of behavior, like human behavior that people don't like to join in until it's popular. Oh yeah. Well, I mean, I've, I've, I've in my sort of entrepreneur world, I, I, I'm, I've always been involved in copywriting and sales copy and, and you know, the, the cues that sort of persuade someone to, to click a button to scroll down a page. And, and there is so much of that, um, and the dynamics that go into, to, uh, crowdfunding from the social proof to mm-hmm. the fear of missing out to just, there's so much of, w- of what you just, uh, pointed out. Yeah. It's just so interesting. So like, for example, on the, on the very easy, simple scale, you make a Facebook post. I've seen like beautiful poems and well-written things on Facebook. If, but if no one likes it, Everyone's like nervous to be the first or the second or the third, but I've seen like quote lesser quality things on social media, for example, that get spread around all the time, but it's because, you know, they have the popularity, like you said, the social proof. And all of a sudden it's, it's, it's just so interesting to me. Like it's not, it's not only high quality that always wins, you know? Um, and that's such, such an interesting concept. Um, yeah. Especially with Facebook, you get into the whole, um, edge rank scores. And if not a lot of people have liked your last post, then your next post, Facebook just doesn't show to as many people. Mm. Um, oh, there's, there's so much, um, uh, that goes on behind the scenes in terms of like what optimizes a post and who sees it and, uh, how Facebook uh, helps people interact with it. It's very interesting. Yeah. I mean, that could, I mean, I had a, I definitely want to look into that actually. I didn't know that was part of the algorithm, for example. Oh yeah. Yeah. Happy, happy to chat with you about what little I know about that sometime. Yeah, for sure. That's no, I mean, this is a whole other thing about what we're learning here is, um, what we've been calling the hidden curriculum. It's, it's the, some of the parts you need to be, if you don't know these skills, you're not going to be able to build, you know, Social media is a huge skill that some, that is very important to understand now, for example. Um, and you, and you can tap into that power. And again, that's just something again, that we're just not even, it's not even part of our awareness. In fact, we're being told, you know, not to, 
we're being told to be to hide ourselves, to be private, to not share. Um, yeah, you know, you know how it is. <laughs> it's the it's the culture do, yeah. one. Um, so, what do you think it means to be a fulfilled physician? Well, I think being a fulfilled physician, first of all, means um, doing something that you're proud of and doing something where you feel like you are appreciated um, by other people and by or by your patients and by people that you work with. Um, but also feeling like the work that you're doing and the activities that you are uh, involved in are letting you realize your full potential. I, I, I think of the phrase when, when they talk about someone who who's God forbid, who, who dies with their music still inside them. Mm. And I always think of being fulfilled as the opposite of that. You, you don't want all of your music to be inside you. You want to be, uh, having all parts of what make you who you are out there. And that's, I mean, to me that that's what living your full potential means. It means all of these things that are a part of you and important to you and make you special are actively a part of what you're doing in life. Um, so anyway, for me, at least that's, that's, that's what being fulfilled is, is about. Wow. That was really powerful. I mean, <laughs> Thank that, you. that image that you gave me like dying with like the music still inside you. Oh, that's so sad. Yeah. Yeah. And I, you know, I think for so many generations, that was just how it worked. And I mean, that was, uh, you just swallowed it and took it and, you know, certainly the baby boomers, um, in many ways, I think that was kind of their MO, um, not for everyone, but, um, less, less so now. And, uh, definitely for me, that's something that that's been more and more important to me as, uh, as the past couple of years have gone on. Yeah. And, and I have to say in the time of 2018, especially if you're able to listen to this podcast, for example, you are in such a privileged position on this planet to be able to be on your device or on a laptop listening to a conversation. And I mean, there's, there's, you have full opportunity to let that music, you know, outside of you and to share that with the world. Um, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, no, that's a, that's a very powerful image though. Uh, yeah, no, that was very well said. What are, what are tips you would like for the listeners to take away from, from your journey so far? I think the, I'm not sure if this counts as tips or advice, but I think the, uh, the big takeaway that I keep seeing in all sorts of different forms is letting yourself nurture the things that, uh, you feel are special about you, um, and making room in your life. Um, it's different for everyone. I mean, I, I had a friend, um, a couple of years ago in residency who, um, she told me a couple of times she always kind of wanted to be a designer. Hmm. Um, and I'm not sure, you know, w what's happened with, with her in terms of her creative stuff. Um, you know, we haven't kept in touch, but I always think of, uh, you know, beneath the surface with everyone, there's this little part of you that remembers what you used to do, you know, <laughs> Hmm. These joke about, you know, what we did when we had a life before medicine, <laughs> but, but it really doesn't have to be that way. So whether it's a tip or advice, I think, um, we all have parts of us that are special and we, we, we know are special about us that, uh, we haven't paid as much attention to maybe. Um, and I think, uh, making, making room in your life to reconnect with them and sort of keep those things going are, it's important for us. And frankly, it's important for our patients. It makes us just better, better doctors anyway. <laughs> I was, I was giving a little hand clap there. Yeah. I, uh, I love what you said though. That was amazing. Um, I, I can see why uh, you're up on stage uh, speaking at a Ted talk. That's <laughs> like, thank you. No, I, I like, I really like that. Um, yeah, that's great tips. So again, I, I have to say, I thank you so much for your time today. Um, more oh, and, this has been so much fun. More and more, I learned that time is such a precious commodity. And even just to, you know, virtually connect how we are uh, right now, it's uh, it's truly amazing that we can do this. Um, and I really appreciate your time today, Dr. David Hinden. Um, I'm going to provide the um, 
the links for the YouTube channel. I'll provide the links for the, the application as well. I want you guys to check it out. I, I watched the episodes they had. I checked out the application. Um, and guys, this is a really amazing stuff and it's a building journey. Um, and so we're all learning with David Hinden. Um, and I'm excited for the process. Well, thank you so much for having me. This has been awesome. Uh, thank you. All right. Take care. All right. Take care. Thank you so much for listening to the Happy Doc Podcast, the voice of fulfilled physicians. If you enjoyed the episode, please drop us a like, comment, and share. Share us through the social media channels we have on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. The handle is at Happy Doc Podcast. That's at Happy Doc Podcast. You can find our website at www.thehappydoc.com. Again, thank you so much for listening to The Happy Doc, the voice of fulfilled physicians. Ha, ha, ha.